Uh, anyway, thanks, thanks so much, Mitch. And uh, it's we're so honored to have you here as as one of the uh, very greats of the fourth world. So uh, next, we'll move on to Brad, who has started screen sharing. And uh, speakers, introduce yourself if you think that there's something I should have said about you. Uh, please say it. Uh, or message me and I'll I'll say it for you or something. Uh, and on with the show. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you five by five. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm I'm going to give a. I'm Brad Nelson. Um, uh, in, uh, fellow interested in various uh, aspects of uh, fourth and, and various domains that it can be applied in. Um, I, um, I'm going to talk about two separate things. Um, one of them is a, a, a topic that I keep bumping, which is uh, I've been for the last several talks that I've given at SVFIG, uh, done something a little unusual with the slides. And I, I uh, wanted to sort of do a little aside on this. This part, this part is not strictly fourth. And then the other thing uh, is to talk about our uh, ongoing uh, efforts with a, uh, a version of uh, uh, fourth for ESP32 uh, uh, through Arduino and uh, sort of adding to that feature set and sort of what's a, what's a foot with that. So what's up with the slides? Um, so I've been um, using a, a different presentation tool uh, for the last while. Um, for a long time, for those of you who've seen some of my prior talks, um, I, uh, for quite some time, have been using a thing called Reveal.js, which is this um, uh, JavaScript uh, tool that lets you uh, make a slide deck sort of uh, with HTML tags. And it's, you know, you, you put in your text and you, uh, you still have to know various uh, sort of tags and wrap things around it. And um, it has quite a lot of flexibility. You can, uh, you know, sort of do, do arbitrary things with it. Um, but recently, I found myself realizing I was sort of spending a lot of time fiddling with slides and not particularly concerned about the content. And um, I came across this tool. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with, uh, there's this, this group called Suckless that um, have a variety of tools that are, that are not written in fourth. In fact, most of them are written in C. Um, but they're sort of focused on uh, sort of stark minimalism. And, and uh, they try to uh, write the tools sort of with minimal dependencies and, and, and minimal size and, and, and things of this sort. So they have um, one of the more prominent things is that they have a window manager written in a, a small number of lines of C where they sort of the, the way that you configure it is you go change the source code. Um, uh, and uh, in, in this mix of tools, they had a, a tool called Scent, um, which uh, presumably short for pre present. And uh, it, it uses the style that they, they refer to as the Takahashi method uh, after this uh, particular fellow who uh, decided he needed to give some presentations uh, and uh, didn't have anything cool to put in the slides, so he just made the words really big. Um, and the style is just that you uh, you have sort of a minimal set of things. You don't um, you you really just focus on the words, and and uh, to a limited extent, maybe you use um, uh, some Unicode emojis. And um, so I create I, the one problem with this having um, previously done slide presentations. Uh, even, even generated in fourth in various forms that if you can't put something on the web, it sort of doesn't stick around and you can't point people at it. And so I wanted a version of this thing uh, that operated on the web. Uh, the, the tool is 200 lines of JavaScript code. Uh, and I, what I tried to do is sort of stay semi-compatible with the, the scent utility. Uh, and I'll show you in a second what this looks like. But basically, the idea is that you have a, a, a little header on the top, a few lines, uh, maybe setting up some things, some basic customization. And then everything else is just Unicode text. And if you skip, a, if you skip, you know, two lines in a row, um, that's a, that's a, a slide boundary. And so it allows you to just sort of crank out slides as fast as you please, uh, and it just stretches them to, to fill up the screen as as fully as it can. Um, there is a syntax uh, to embed images. Uh, the sort of caveat on that is that if you use images, it fills the entire screen, and, and that's it. Um, the um, so why. The focus is on content. It, it has made it really nice to sort of cut and paste source code. One thing that I used to spend a lot of time fiddling with uh, in various forms, especially for various reasons with fourth source code, uh, with Reveal JS, is sort of making it happy embedded in uh, in JavaScript. Uh, this tool is able to uh, let me just sort of literally, you know, cut and paste from from source code and display it and, and not think too hard. 
um, things fit. I don't have to worry about like, oh, is this slide too big or, or whatever. Um, and uh, if I do happen to want to embellish something with an image, I just, you know, go search the internet for, you know, an emoji of a certain type and, and paste it right in. So this, this is literally what the input looks like. And it, like in a source, source code uh, editor, I can just, you know, put in words and skip a line. And if I happen to cut and paste uh, tech, you know, an image, uh, or not an image, but rather a, a Unicode character, uh, then, then that will show up. And so something like this, these, these three sections turn into slides like that. Um, uh, if you put an at sign in the name of a file, then it will embed an image. Um, I, I added one sort of weird constraint to myself, which is that I wanted these to be viewable on a sort of a dumb uh, browser that doesn't have JavaScript enabled. And so I sort of uh, went and insisted that, well, whenever I do one of these at signs, which I do very rarely, I'll also include an image tag. And so if you open one of these presentations and turn off JavaScript, you don't get the nice slideshow um, operation, but you, you, get, uh, you can sort of see everything in line. Um, the, uh, the way you interact with it, there's just keys to move left and right. Um, if you're, uh, you're outside, it'll show a slide number up above. And so as I move forward and backward, if you notice up on the, the URL, there's a, you can link inside to individual slides. Um, and then uh, this, is, this is an example of you know, an image. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the code, the code itself is, uh, is uh, not very much and, and not, not a ton. It's possible to reference it, uh, you know, that's, that's it. <laughs> um, so just sort of bare, bare minimum, I, it's a little bigger than it would be just because I've made it uh, have enough plumbing to be able to, uh, to uh, work on a phone uh, with, with touch events and things of that sort. But for example, uh, this, pres this is the, the text of this presentation. And so, um, you know, Literally, I'm just, I've got this little header with a little bit of magic and sort of what would be the first slide. Um, and then, uh, and then just put in some text, type it, type it, and, and that's, that's your presentation. Um, it, it runs, uh, it, this is the original uh, web sent, or original sent tool, and you get junk on the first page, but after the first page, oops, I'm having, all right, well, something is unhappy with that, probably all the zoom things ignore <laughs> ignore the, the man behind the curtain there for whatever yeah anyways they, they work in the scent tool under normal circumstances and enough about that let's get on to the uh the main topic of the presentation um so um we've recently rebranded uh, what what i was last time i presented here calling micro e fourth uh, as, as esp32 fourth the reason for the rebranding uh is uh to uh target the audience at uh, for the fourth 2020 group. Uh, uh, Peter uh, there has been uh, promoting a sort of a, a set of uh, ESP, a version of fourth that you can put on an ESP32 fairly easily if you're set up with the Arduino tool. Um, to reduce sort of branding confusion, we've, we've rebranded uh, micro e fourth as, as this. And, uh, uh, and, and thanks Dr. Ting for, for uh, flexibility around uh, the sort of the naming and all of that. Um, Hopefully, this will translate into folks being able to use Forth, and, and Peter's been trying to reach out to, to a broad international audience. Um, there's also now a, a, a website uh, that we put up uh, to um, sort of document the system and uh, sort of, you know, actual attempt at, at uh, describing what, what it has and where to get the latest version and, and all of that uh, sort of thing. Um, the uh, I'll very briefly cover a couple of the, the, the new things that have shown up uh, since since I last presented to this group. There's a little bit of overlap in this presentation of the one that I did at the uh, fourth 2020 group. Um, one big thing is that we've added vocabularies. Um, the primary motivation for this is that uh, there were there is now enough functionality, especially in the Arduino version um, or the ESP32 Arduino version, uh, where there was um, it was getting uh, quite large if you typed words and listed everything out, you got way too much stuff. Um, and so now each of the different uh, categories of, uh, of uh, bindings to, to different things like serial port and Wi-Fi and whatnot are all broken out into their own vocabulary. Um, the, um, it's a, there's a general facility for vocabularies. It's uh, relatively standard words with, with one sort of subtle little quirk. Um, it uses a sort of a hybrid between uh, 479 style uh, 
vocabulary some 483 style uh, basically the, the it uh, it largely behaves like 483 with the with the sort of the added thing that it still chains in the way that uh, uh, 479 style vocabularies work so if you for example have a uh, you know a, there's an internals vocabulary that's built in that uh, was is defined inside of the fourth vocabulary when you have uh, activated the internals vocabulary, you can, uh, if, if a word is not found in that vocabulary, it uh, cascades over and uh, uh, it will scan the fourth vocabulary and so on. Um, so sort of all the typical standard words, um, fourth definitions. Um, I, I, if, if anybody has sort of any historical precedent I could cling to, I ended up having vlist list only the current vocabulary and words sort of uh, follow the chain of, of listing all of the, the vocabularies that are visible, um, which is kind of handy occasionally to sort of just see the current word list if there's some convention I would love to hear from folks. Um, one issue um, with the way that the system is brought up because um, uh, ASP 32 fourth sort of tries to have as absolutely little C code in the, in the sort of core of it as possible, um, uh, the initial fourth that comes up doesn't have sort of quite enough rope for vocabularies to work correctly. And so it starts out with a, a lot of the words actually in the fourth vocabulary. So I've added this word transfer uh, to, to move a word into the current vocabulary. Uh, and, and that uh, lets me sort of uh, yank the words out of the, the, the fourth vocabulary that I don't want sort of uh, mucking things up. There's, the, uh, there's also you know, the stack of word lists and, and uh, these work as well um, and are still often useful, um, even with the sort of 479 style chaining. Um, the uh, uh, only a slightly non-standard in that it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it actually does not strip away everything down to a, uh, to an only vocabulary. It sort of just does, um, uh, it, it brings you back to the fourth vocabulary and then progresses from there. Um, if you really want the 483 style vocabularies, um, I, I've got a word sealed that will, uh, uh, chop off the chaining in, in, a, in the current vocabulary. Um, we added a block editor um, just because I was I was about to try to add a, a, a sort of a source code editor and found that well, you know it's easier to write a block editor. So, uh, so I started there uh, and added blocks in the process of sort of all the usual words. Um, it's, it's sort of of my own, it's a line editor of my own sort of devising very, very simple, straightforward. So just single character, you know, list the current uh, line and delete a line and, and then you enter text by, you know, having a line number and, and uh, an R or, or, or A to, to insert and, and so on. Um, and I'll, I'll show that off a second. Um, I'll, I'll sort of double up the demo um, by demoing um, another thing. Um, there is a, there are versions of the thing that can, um, that can operate um, on both Linux and uh, and Windows. I'm going to use a a terminal. Oops, I can't remember the path to it. I'm going to use a terminal uh, to talk to the serial. Oops, I need to actually plug in my plug in the board. Um, so um, so this is I'm now talking to just the local Linux system, but I'm going to run terminal. And now I'm going to be talking to this uh, ESP32 board. Um, so, um, so there's, you know, now uh, this. If you've done uh, words, words or vlist in the uh, on the system previously, you would have previously seen a whole bunch of um, uh, things that were uh, sort of polluting the namespace. So now, for example, you know, if you go into the serial vocabulary, there's a oops. I can type. Uh, it, it, the words for serial port are isolated uh, off on their own, and and uh, you know you can there's you know individual words for or individual vocabularies, so say for camera support and things of that support that that sort. Um, uh, so a little bit less cluttered. Um, the uh, oh yeah, I was going to demo the line. It, so the so if you do, in, there's an editor vocabulary, sort of. Typical, the typical thing, you can you know do n and, and p to move forward and backward. You can load a load a block and have it run and do a thing. So, um, and and it persists on the uh, the SPI flash storage on the device. Uh, let's go back to the slides. Um, Brad, may may I ask you a question? Yes, please. 
Uh, how you add a, a new block? You, ah, that's a good, that's a great question. Um, so because the, the uh, depending on how you've touched uh, storage, the block editor, the, the, uh, the blocks can end up initialized to zeros. So yeah. if, if you're, uh, if you're say on, on a block like this, um, what you can, if you go in and say, for example, do N to go to the next block, the problem is that you'll see that they're all uh, filled with nulls. Um, there's the word wipe, which will blank it and fill it with, uh, with spaces. And then you can sort of uh, go to town and, and say, okay, you know, here, my new block and uh, something of that sort. And then, yeah, so. And, and if you, so as you, you know, if you wanted to jump ahead, you could, you know, jump to block 20 and list it and okay, block 20 is empty. And so you wipe it and then, um, and so on. But, so you're, you're sort of able to, to, to enter, enter things, you know, in each block and this is, this is block 20. Does it, does that cover what you wanted to? All right. So um, um, one other thing that I've documented uh, that's worth flagging to folks, I've tried to make it really easy for folks, uh, especially on Arduino, to add um, uh, additional words to the sort of C core of the thing. On, for, on the Linux version, um, it's, uh, it uses dynamic linking to pull everything in so that literally it's only pulling in like DL sim and I think one other, one, one other word uh, is the only other sort of dependency on uh, on the OS and then everything gets sort of pulled in dynamically. Um, but on Arduino, because everything's statically linked, um, folks need to be able to add their own stuff. I've used X macros extensively. And so uh, it's a little bit uh, of C magic, but, but the net result is that if you wanna add a new word, it's as easy as this. You, you, you add a, a single line like this uh, in the particular place and, and uh, re rebuild uh, the executable and, and uh, your, your word will show up and forth. Um, of course, this assumes a word that does nothing and has no, no parameters. Um, if, you, uh, if you happen to have a, a word that has characters that are not valid in a C identifier, you need to do uh, something like this, uh, where you have the sort of the three element item, notice the, the X versus the Y. Um, there's a push word if you have a, a value that wants to return a single element and put it on the stack. Um, there are some uh, names that you can use from C to refer to the various elements on the stack, either as, as uh, integers or, or pointers to character or, uh, or bytes or, uh, or, or void and so on. Um, and so for example, if you had a, a C function like this that you wanted to pull in, you could uh, do something like this where you uh, describe the, you know, the name here. This one was done with an X because the dash is not a valid character in a C identifier. You have to make up a name. I should mention in this X form, you need to make up a name um, and it just needs to be some arbitrary unique identifier. It doesn't actually matter what it is. It's just being used by the C compiler as a name for it. Um, and then you need to balance the stack at the end. And there's a, there's a word drop for, or there's a, a macro for, for that. Um, you can, there's a set word if you just want to replace what's on the top of the stack. Um, and uh, your, another sort of style that you can do these in is you can declare variables uh, in here. You'll notice that there needs to be a trailing uh, backslash because these are all getting glued together in, into a giant uh, macro list. Um, so pulling in a, a, an outside module sort of is straightforward. You just sort of each of the words that you want to reference, you can expose them. Um, this, the web server is a good example if you have something that has an object that you need to, uh, to create. And there's a, it's also a good example if you happen to need to do a callback. I, I plan to paper this over with a little bit nicer pattern for what you have to do if you want to have a, a callback from C into four. Um, one thing I added just the other day is dictionary pickling. Um, the idea being that uh, you might want to save and, and restore the, the state of the dictionary uh, to an image on disk. Um, it actually only captures sort of the high watermark after the system boots. Um, I've tried to make some very basic attempts to keep the system compatible, uh, but I by no means, uh, it, so in theory you can, uh, reflash the uh, the Arduino the uh, INO part of the system, and your images may stay stable. I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on it long term. I mean, we may put some work into making this work better, but this is a, a sort of a, more like a thing you could do to to keep state uh, within a, a given version. Um, there's a string form of these. Um, within that, there's a uh, a word for uh, uh, specifying a boot word. 
And now there's two additional words, remember, which will snapshot um, the state of the system to a, um, to a file on disk and the uh, startup, which will uh, specify what actually say, it will do the same thing as remember, plus it will specify a word to, to do on boot. Um, so uh, let me, actually, I, I will, let me roll into the next topic. Um, I, I've added Telnet daemon. Um, Telnet, for those of you unfamiliar with it, uh, it's, it's a, one of the sockets protocols. It's, uh, it's just the most basic sort of interaction protocol you could have. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, it listens on port 23, and then you're able to uh, connect to it and, and interact with the device. And so this is a sort of yet another option. Um, there's also bl uh, Bluetooth, which I demo demoed last time, and uh, there's a, a web interface as well. Um, I'll, yeah, so I'll use this as an excuse to go back into the system here. So uh, actually, I can't even remember. We're on, I, let's see, go back to the fourth vocabulary, and we're, oh yeah, we're actually on the, so we're on the uh, ESP32 here. So imagine that we wanted to uh, uh, do Telnet. Um, what, what I can do here is um, I've got my password saved over on block 18. I'm not going to show it to you all because I had to reset my passwords last time for my Wi-Fi network. So that will uh, initialize the, the Wi-Fi network. The way you would do that yourself is you could specify your, your network name and then your, uh, your password and, uh, and then you can do uh, login and it will log you into your, your local Wi-Fi network. Um, and so that being in block 18 uh, is great, but what I actually want to do is maybe I want to set up this device to be available over, uh, over Telnet in the future. Uh, so let's say I define a word boot and maybe I'll have it load my password and get on the Wi-Fi network. Um, and then I have my Telnet daemon and I will, uh, and now I'm actually, I'm actually forgetting whether it's, uh, let's see. I need to, to look, it's ah, server. So I need to do, uh, so I'll have my, my boot, uh, I'll, I'll, my boot up process will be, I will get on the Wi-Fi network um, and then I'll run this, uh, this uh, Telnet uh, daemon server. And uh, so then uh, if I do startup colon boot, I'm able to uh, store that out uh, to a, uh, an, uh, an image on disk. So now if I do, um, if I do buy, uh, buy will reboot the board and you'll see all the junk from it. There's a, a three second pause that we've added as a good idea from folks. And uh, if you hit any key during over the serial port during that time, it will, uh, it will reset, uh, it, will, it will skip over any, any startup logic. So you can, uh, if, you, if you hose yourself, that's now a, a good way to get out of that. Um, if I can successfully find the window here. Um, for those of you who are uh, interacting with uh, terminals and whatnot and, and are sad for the, the days of hyperterminal and all of that, um, I, I recommend Putty. It's, a, it's got all kinds of capabilities. It can be a, a Telnet terminal. Uh, it can also be a serial terminal, in fact. Um, but I'm going to use it for this purpose uh, as a um, as a uh, as a telnet terminal. And um, I'm actually I put the for various reasons, including my home network, I put the um, the telnet port actually on not on port 23, but on 1080 or on, on 8080. Uh, as it happens, 23, you know, telnet is uh, just just for context. Obviously, it's not encrypted, so um, historically, it's been a, a source of vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, but in any event, um, we can now run it, connect to it, and if we're lucky, oh no, demo fail. This is good. Oops, there we go. There it goes. Uh, it was. Yep. And now we're connected over uh, over Telnet to the uh, to the uh, the device. If we uh, if we do uh, we could do C boot, and we should be able to see. Whoa, that's not good. Uh, now we can see our uh, we can see our uh, uh, that word that we had defined and stored uh, in the boot up routine. If I want to prevent the uh, the boot up from uh, if I want to clear away that that boot up routine, I can do reset. And now uh, on a reboot, it will no longer bring up the uh, the daemon. And that is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Sun silence. Brad, you go so fast. I am, I am still thinking what you said. <laughs> <laughs> per 
per perhaps too fast, or perhaps I tried to cram too much in. Where uh, yes, <clears throat> it was a lot, a lot of stuff here, a lot of new, of new interesting uh, features. So this is Christian, uh, Brad. Did I get it right? We now have a new version of the ESP32 Ford that has new features as well. Uh, yes, these are. This is so it, we're trying to keep it sort of evergreen. And so now, if you at any time go to ESP32 Ford AppSpot.com, uh, so it's really just that uh, we have the, the the latest version available. If you want to actually build it. Uh, so this one has a, this site has a, a sort of a pickled up uh, version that's all in one uh, INO file sort of ready to be loaded. Um, if you want to sort of follow along uh, as to how I uh, develop it, there's a little bit of an indirection in, in, in how I prepare it because I want to build uh, multiple different versions for different systems. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's there and uh, ready for, ready for folks to, to try it out. We, we I've generally tried to, uh, to keep it evergreen, but uh, to give you a sense, like here's the, you know, it's still uh, on ESP32, one, one gigantic file, um, a little bit of C macro magic to give you the basic vocabulary, those, those new uh, shortcuts, all the bindings for all the words that get pulled in from C for, uh, for, for the, the tiny little bit of C code to boot the system. And then the vast bulk of the system is just a bunch of fourth code that runs at startup that's embedded in a string, uh, including the web server and a bunch of other stuff. And then this is one little bit of additional binding for the, uh, for the, the web server. By the way, one of the reasons I was playing around with Telnet is as a warm up. Um, one of the things I'm planning to do is the, the web server that's embedded in there uses an, Ar uh, an Arduino library for the web server. And it, that library has a number of performance and sort of stability limitations. And so I'm, I'm planning to swap out that library for an equivalent thing uh, written in fourth, which will uh, change the, the balance even further uh, to, to there being more fourth. So. Uh, I'll, Christian again? Yes. Uh, most of my previous experience with fourth was with flash fourth. And in there, I really had contact with the hardware. Mm -hmm. I get the feeling that now, if I don't go through C, I have no contact with the hardware. Is that true? Um, yeah, yes and no. So I, I think that the, the um, one, one avenue that I've been meaning to sort of pursue with this version of things is that to get things going, we have depended pretty heavily on C, but um, some of the different functionality is readily accessible by virtue of the fact that, you know, in this fourth, you have, you have access to, to raw memory. And so, um, for example, all of the GPIOs, um, there's no particular reason that that couldn't be something that's defined in terms of, uh, in terms of fourth words. It, it happened to be slightly easier to bring the system up that way, but I think to uh, rely on, on uh, these C bindings. On the other hand, when you're talking about something like Bluetooth, the, the, the reality is that the, the, the stack that you would have to write to support Bluetooth is both uh, large and, and uh, sort of has all kinds of semi-proprietary facets, at least in terms of how it works in the ESP32. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. I would say that for very basic things in the chip, I, I kind of do aspire to uh, getting, it, uh, getting down uh, to, uh, to directly accessing them and, and sort of dropping more of the libraries that uh, that wrap the thing, um, but uh, when it comes to yeah the Wi-Fi stack or the Bluetooth stack, there's there's enough complexity there that uh, having that library to uh, those libraries to fall fall back on is uh, seemingly necessary. So. Uh, Christian, again, I realize that the ESP32 is a very unusual memory model. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I because I tried to go to the hardware level and. I realize that uh, we we have to be very careful when we do it because yep. uh, we'll get all kind of error messages. <laughs> yes, one, like one of the it. one of the, the things that I I'm sort of admit, I one one change versus uh, Dr. King C fourth that I, I made that I I'm still a little on the fence about whether it was a good idea is that he had a um, uh, he had sort of a virtual 64k space. Uh, in which the memory operated, and then you had to explicitly use a, a peek and a poke word 
to reach outside to that larger memory space. And one mild advantage of that approach is that uh, it, it, it uh, saves you the danger of, you know, if you, if you access the wrong location, everything comes crashing down. And unfortunately, uh, the ESP32, as far as I can tell, it's not possible to have a, uh, a handler for certain types of out of bounds accesses. And so you're, you, 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 know, you touch the wrong location, it, it reboots the board. So um, there's a kernel, there's just a panic at that point. Yeah. Um, I do realize that I simply try to do a dump of memory starting at address zero for 256 byte and I got illegal memory access. Yep, yep. <laughs> the, uh, um, it, it is something where I, I've, I've thought about, um, you know, the, the memory map is, is, uh, is sort of tedious in various ways, but is constrained in terms of where, so there's, there's a bunch of banks of, of the, the memory where some, some of them are actually repeats of each other and some of them are sort of the version of things that you have to, to uh, you have to sort of bank switch in different pieces. And uh, it, it might be possible to pretty easily like have a wrapper around load and store that uh, keep you from accidentally touching something bad. The, the trouble of course with such things is that then you're spending the cost of bounce checking and all of that. So I, I am tempted though for user interactivity to, to maybe put some guardrails around uh, what you hit. That, that said, honestly, and you know, sort of with 2020 hindsight, there is some virtue to Dr. Ting's approach of just sort of saying, well, we'll have this memory space for fourth and. And, and, uh, and then if you really want to reach out and touch something outside, then use these explicit words to know when you know what you're doing. Because the, the, the only thing that got me sort of not doing that was the, was the inconvenience of if you're calling into a bunch of the, uh, the Arduino words that expect a, a pointer from the system, uh, it, uh, it's sort of annoying because then, then you'd have to have a conversion word to convert back and forth from internal and external addresses. But. Just one comment. Yes. Uh, congratulations for understanding this uh, processor used in the ESP32. I, I, I won't. I, I won't. I won't purport to understand it until I. So I have aspirations of doing a native fork for the thing, but uh, so I won't. I won't uh, sort of uh, uh, claim to understand it until I've gotten there. But uh, the uh, I, I've been reading up on the Extensa instruction set and all of that. So I. I, I think I'm going to work up the courage and uh, play around with that direction as well. The, th that said, the one ad other advantage that, uh, that, that Peter, Peter will and others will test to here is that uh, with, with going through the Arduino tool and doing it in C is that it uh, provides a simpler way for us to distribute something that, uh, that for the hobbyist community that's used to those tools, uh, they're comfortable with. And so it's a, a foot in the door, if you will. So. I, want to share, I want to share my screen here one moment. Uh, let me see. I think we need to move on, Christian. Can you communicate with Brad uh, either in the chat or by, by email? No problem. I know that I'm uh, asking a lot of questions, so I'll leave some room for the others. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's move on. Thank you so much, Brad. Uh, this is a, a remarkable uh, set of things you've communicated to us. Uh, so I've remarked upon 